everyone. It's today, or I mean, 200, 202 people showed up in this building for two services on Christmas Eve night, and that shows us what we're capable of here in this area. There are that many people there are roughly that many people wanting to know. And so that gives us hope for the coming year, gives us direction. Let's make that happen, okay? Sorry, still trying to get these put together from, from previous time. Okay. So have you ever wondered where God was? Have you ever wondered when God was going to show up? Have you ever wondered, is God going to fulfill what God has promised to us or, or to you individually? So very long ago, Israel was quite in that very same spot. They wondered where God was. They were God's special people. They were God's chosen race. They were God's partners in ministry, Abraham covenant, all of that Moses' covenant to go into the world and be God's partners in ministry and changing things. And yet, they still wondered where God was. They were waiting for God to do what God had promised. Where is the Messiah? Where is this promised king, this promised ruler? And the scripture that, that Judy read for us today, Isaiah 61, 10 through 62, 3, comes exactly out of that time. It comes out of that waiting period. Where is the Messiah? And just before this in Isaiah, or as a good a Brit would say, Isaiah, right? And if you look at it, it kind of makes more sense to say it, Isaiah, but whatever, we'll say Isaiah. When that comes right out of that is the promise of the coming Messiah, the suffering servant, the king, the, the coming one who will bring peace and blessings to Israel and to the world, the good news. That's what the gospel is, right? You know that. Gospel comes from the Greek word euangelion, which, comes from, which is the word for good news. And for something to, have, to be good news, it must have happened, right? You had a great time on Christmas Day, I hope. <clears throat> we did, for the most part. It was good news. Thinking about it doesn't make it good news. The event happening makes it good news. And so they were waiting for the good news to come. And you know what? People of Christmas that we are, people of Christmas that we are, the good news has come to us in Jesus, the Messiah, Christ the Lord. We are people of that. And this passage describes what will happen when God shows up. And just for good measure, I want to read it to you again, just so that you hear this. Judy did a great job, but I want to read it to you again. Isaiah 61, 10 through 62, 3. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, and my whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. And he has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots and as the garden causes what is sown to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. And then it switches over to God's voice speaking. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall, shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. When God shows up, guys, out of this passage, I'm going to say three things happen. When, when God shows up, three things happen. Of course, it's a sermon. There's got to be three things. The first thing is rejoicing. The first thing is when God shows up, because of the gifts God has given to his people, we're going to rejoice. We are going to rejoice when God shows up in the Messiah. In our passage for today, Israel greatly rejoices in the Lord. Israel greatly rejoices. But that, of course, instantly begs the question, well, why? 
why does Israel rejoice in the Lord? And by the very same token, why do you, why do I rejoice in the Lord our God? And I'll just open that up really quick. What are some things we rejoice about in God? Anybody want to just holler one out so that we all hear? Hope. Hope. Friendship. Friendship. Love. Love. What was it? Mercy. Mercy. Grace. Grace. Peace. Peace. Grandkids. Kids. Cold weather. <laughs> no? Okay, no one. Oh, we've grown on that one. There's lots of reasons to rejoice, guys, but here in this particular passage, Israel is supposed to rejoice, and let's say we are supposed to rejoice when the coming of the Messiah arrives because of the gifts that God gives to his people. Those two gifts are, we read here, salvation and righteousness. So church, I'm going to invite you all to rejoicing today. I'm going to invite you to rejoicing in the Lord your God in the arrival of Jesus Messiah because of the gifts that God has given to you. Salvation and righteousness. Gifts of God to us. Now, as they are gifts, they are not earned. Nor are they taken back. They are given to us freely for us to receive or to refuse. They are gifts, but I would invite you to receive them today. Salvation and righteousness that causes us to rejoice. Up at Dakota Church last Christmas Eve, on the way out the door, there were, there were 75 people in Dakota Church, guys. It was awesome. There was this lady. I don't even know who she was. I, maybe it was one of you. I don't know. I was in a fog. People were going out the door, and I was just saying, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. And one lady stopped, and she said, I love your enthusiasm. That's such a gift. And you know what there is to be enthusiastic about? Life in God. Life in Christ. Jesus is born. Jesus has come. Jesus has died. Jesus has rose again. Jesus reigns on high. And if that's not enough to get your fire burning, then you woods wet. Okay? That is something to rejoice about because we are given the gift of Grace and mercy in Christ Jesus. I'm going to take you, I'm, help me feel at home here. When I say that's something to be thankful for, I want you all to say amen, okay? <laughs> the grace and mercy and the gifts of God are something to be thankful and rejoice about. Amen. Hey, all right, thanks. Now I do feel at home. That is something we are going to sing praises about. We are very happy. The joy of the Lord should pour out of every part of our being, the joy of our God, because he has given good things to his people, should be our state of mind. The joy of the Lord is our strength and our state of being. We rejoice in the Lord our God because of what he has done for us. Okay? This building should rock because of the joy of the Lord in this place. I, I talked about it last a little bit last Christmas Eve. I'm going to use another Dakota Church illustration on, I'm not a good singer. I just yell. You know that. And I was just yelling up there. And one of my favorite songs to yell at Christmas time is Go Tell It on the Mountain. And I do not hit it well, but I hit it loud. Okay. And they were all smirking under their breath as we yelled the song. And on the last refrain, go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere, they decided, the entire congregation, it's some move of God, decided that they were going to put aside their, um, we don't sing much. They set that aside and they just let it rip. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills, and everywhere. Everybody was smiling. They couldn't believe it themselves that they were singing that loudly. And the walls rumbled. Because Jesus Christ is born, the joy of the Lord. And if that's not something to rejoice about, I don't know what is. Rejoice in the Lord always. Now, let's get a little further along here. The we are to rejoice because we have received salvation and righteousness from God. That's what Isaiah says. We have received salvation and righteousness. Now, salvation and righteousness in this passage help explain one another. 
Salvation and righteousness. Salvation shows that righteousness is a gift. Okay? Salvation says righteousness is a gift. And righteousness shows that salvation is more than deliverance from a guilty conscience or from physical bondage. So what do we mean here? Biblical salvation, everybody, is a full-orbed, full everything, full life salvation. The whole person gets salvation, okay? It is a matter that has to do not only with liberation from death, but liberation from every oppressive power in life. That's what salvation means. In the salvation of Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit, we are set free from every slavery. We are set free from every oppression. We are set free from every dis ease. We are set free from bondage to death. We are set free from bondage to sin. We are set free from bondage to hate. We are set free like Martin Luther King, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. That's salvation. Jesus came, and you know the story, right? Death on the cross said, I got you. Easter morning, Jesus said, no, you don't. Death went away. We are set free from death as God's people. We are set free from the guilt of sin. When we cry, when we cry out to God and accept that, that forgiveness that he offers to us freely, we are set free from that. We are set free from even physical bondage. The first, the first act of salvation in the Bible was, you guessed it, when God set Israel free from slavery in Egypt, free from bondage. That's what salvation means, everybody. He, God, redeems everything in our lives, and we are saved. But remember this, remember this. We are set free from something to something. That's critical. We are set free from bondage to freedom. We are set free from slavery to liberation. We are set free from the country of sin to the country of righteousness. We're set free. We have been delivered. And God says, yes, you have been delivered, Aaron, but now I've got some expectations. You better live like you're set free. You know, don't be like Israel, always whining. Oh, man, let's go back. Let's go back to slavery. At least we had bread. Moses, and Moses is like, oh, you guys are killing me. You're free. So church, let me tell you this. You are free. When we accept the mercy and the salvation, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ this Christmas season, we are set free to righteousness. We are set free to live the way God has set us free to live, to reflect God, to be Jesus' people, free from all of that trash. We are a different people. Did you hear that in verse 3 of Isaiah 62? You, no, I'm sorry, verse 2. You shall be called a new name. You shall be called a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You know why God would give you a new name? Because names are very important in, uh, in Israel like culture of this era. Names were very important. Names denoted who you were, your character. And so when God gave somebody a new name, it showed their new state, their new person, their new being. So church today, has God given you a new name? Have you received the new name of Christ that he has given to you? That God delights to give to all of us that we might rejoice. I wish I was as happy as this little boy right here, right? <laughs> Let's all be like that in Christ. God will give us the power and the Holy Spirit to live like that if we will but accept it, set free from bondage to freedom, living as Christian people. I'll say it, I've said it before, I'll say it again. No hypocrites allowed. No hypocrites allowed. Put aside our hypocrisy for a while, shall we? And let's move forward in true Christian faith, reflecting the Lord our God. All right? Let's do that. That's the first thing when God shows up. 
There we go. The second thing that happens when God shows up in Jesus, the Messiah, is found in verse 11, and it is we grow. Hear this. For the earth, for as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as the garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Who's making a New Year's resolution today? Tomorrow. Anybody making those? You do those? And you know people that do those? I love to go to the why, right? And I know that starting, to, not tomorrow, but starting on Tuesday, that thing is going to be so full, you're not even going to be able to get in anywhere, right? You're going to, everybody wants, and it's great. They're like, this year I'm going to be healthy. I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to eat salad. I'm going to eat so much salad, I may turn green. And then by Valentine's Day, they know I'm just going to eat chocolate. <laughs> I hate to see this big heart full of Russell Stover's candy go to waste. Go to the gym. Oh, I'm busy. And so, the, but, but for the next two months, not going to be able to get in because people make New Year's resolutions, okay? And you never hear anybody say bad resolutions. Nobody ever says this year, I'm going to get high cholesterol, <laughs> right? Nobody ever says this year, I'm going to break two bones instead of just one. No, no, we, we, we make good, improving, growing resolutions. We make good resolutions, like I'm going to get healthy, and in, because people, that's the way God is a growing God. That's God. That's reflecting, no matter if you know God or not, you're reflecting God's nature of growth. And so, when God shows up, everybody, we need to grow. We need to grow. Isaiah says, just as God's earth, God's creation is, is faithful, when you plant a seed and the conditions are right, it's going to grow. So too, when God implants within us that faith, that saving faith, if the conditions are right and we want it to, it's going to grow within us. It's going to grow within us and righteousness is going to grow because you, we just talked about it. God delivers us from unrighteousness to righteousness. When we are delivered to righteousness, righteousness is going to grow in us. What's righteousness but reflecting God? What is righteousness? Well, in the Old Testament, it was following the, the Mosaic covenant. But Jesus says, well, let me condense that for you into two that are actually harder to do than the law. Let's say the two commands I give to you. The first is that you shall love the Lord your God with everything you have. And you shall love others as yourself. Upon these two, the law and the prophets hang. And so church, if we're going to grow in righteousness, we're going to grow this year in loving God more. And we're going to grow in loving other people. We're going to grow in those two ways. That's righteousness. That's growth. Okay, that's what it means. And it's not going to be easy. Nothing worthwhile is ever easy, right? I always have to laugh at that. You remember the movie um, with Tom Hanks about baseball, League of Their Own? Do you remember that? And the one girl's crying and Tom Hanks says, are you crying? Are you crying? There's no crying in baseball. <laughs> church, it's going to be hard. There's no crying in church life. No, there is, but whatever. What I mean is, it's going to be hard, and you're going to have to try. And you have to call out to God, fill me with the Holy Spirit every day that I can grow in faith. And I'm going to have to practice, and I'm going to have to devote myself to it, to grow in righteousness, to grow in God. Because we need to pay attention to everything every condition in our lives to grow. Because I know you don't want to fall backwards in your faith, do you? Uh, raise a hand. Does anybody want to go backwards in your faith? Be worse off at the end of the year than you were at the start of the year? Yeah, exactly. Well, let's do this too. Anybody take Latin in high school? Holy cow. Anybody take German? Spanish. Say how blessed by no French? De Portuguese? <laughs> <laughs> Spanish? 
Swahili? I don't know. I mean, because all of you haven't raised your hands, and I don't know what, what I'm trying to think of languages. that. You, how many of you still speak Latin? How many of you speak Portuguese? French? Spanish? Most of us took these languages in high school, and we walked out the door saying, thank you for the diploma. I'm never going to speak that again. And the old axiom is very, very true. If you don't use it, you lose it. Same holds true for your Christian faith, church. You don't use it, you lose it. If we don't make sure it grows, it's not going to grow. It's going to go away, okay? If we're not constantly seeking to improve our faith, we're not going to. Okay, if we're not dedicated to growing our faith, we're not going to. And, you know, quite frankly, our friends and family, co-workers and loved ones and all that, they're going to look at us and say, nice faith, Aaron. Real nice. If that's what it's about, maybe I don't care to know at all. And quite frankly, I don't want to be the person that is a bad witness to those around me because there's so much beauty and grace in, in, in our faith, Right? So this coming year, church, I'm going to challenge you to end 2018 stronger in your faith than you begin tomorrow. I'm going to challenge all of us as a church to end next 2018 stronger in our faith, to have grown in some way more than when we began. I would challenge you to that. I would challenge you to grow in in, in salvation and in righteousness to loving God and to loving others more. I challenge us to that today. Let's pray for one another. Let's pray for ourselves. Let's pray for our church, our region. Let's pray for each other. Let's pray that the Holy Spirit would fill us and empower us to reflect Jesus Christ to all the world around us. Okay, and we're not going to be perfect at it, but let's work at it. Let's Work at it. And I would challenge us to that today. Now, the third thing that happens when God shows up is that we're going to shine. We're going to shine. In our passage today, it switched over from, from Isaiah speaking to God's speaking. And God says, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. And all the kings shall see your glory. The people of God will shine out like the dawn. The people of God will shine like a torch or an LED flashlight in the darkest, darkest place. The people of God will shine. Do you consider yourself a shiner? <laughs> Have you ever considered that your job and my job we are to shine. We are to reflect God into all the world. We are to be a light. We are to blaze like a torch. This promise is that God will not stop until His people are vindicated. His people shine. Israel thought that God was silent. Israel thought, where is God? They thought He seems to be not doing anything. But in Isaiah here, we read how God tirelessly works for His people. Tirelessly works for His people. And there's lots of examples of when we think God is silent. April and I are still trying to sell that house back in Riverton, right? Every day we pray, God, send somebody to us. We'll give them a good deal. We won't try to take advantage. You know, we'll, please, God. And sometimes we think, well, psh, did we miss the boat? You know, we had that one lady, that God not taking care of us anymore. But God doesn't work like that, Right? God works tirelessly to bring about the good for those who call on His name. God works ceaselessly to bring about good for His people. This applies to you and to me. When we think that God has forgotten us, and I'll tell you, in, in the darkest part of, the quietest part of our heart, I'll bet a lot of us have sometimes felt God has forgotten us. 
And we need to be reminded today, this seventh day of Christmas, God has not forgotten you. God has not forgotten any of us. God will bring us to that place of shining. Remember that God loves you so very much. Which brings us very nicely to the second half of this passage. You are a beautiful possession in the hands of God. As am I. A shining jewel. A beautiful crown. A diadem. You are something special in the hands of God. You are not a worm to be smashed by the old man upstairs with the long beard and lightning in his hand. That's Zeus from Greek mythology. You are the possession of your God. If you will recognize that. For God has called you by a new name. And one of the new names is beloved. You are God's beloved. As am I. And God is working ceaselessly, tirelessly to bring about what is good for us. That we might shine like the sun. His people, glorious and radiant. Now, I'm not going to say that whole, you know, health and wealth gospel. Where everything's going to be right in your life. Because quite frankly, it not. Life still stinks most of the time. But in the stinkiness, you're going to shine. Right? And people's going to say, wow, how in the world can you be so graceful when such bad things are happening? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Right? The joy of the Lord is my strength. You are God's dearest possession to shine into the world. So church, let me wrap this whole thing up. I'm convinced that our faith in God, our faith in Jesus Christ, is the most important thing in the world. Do you believe that? I'm convinced that our faith in Christ is the most important thing in the world. And I'm also firmly convinced that the local church, whatever church flavor it is, that calls upon the name of the Lord, is the hope of the world. I'm convinced that the church is the hope of the world Because of what God has done through Jesus. And I want to invite everybody, all of us, everybody sitting here today, I want to invite all of us to life-changing faith. I want to invite you to life-changing faith. Maybe most of us have it. Maybe some some here who don't have it, but you want it. That life-changing, life-altering faith. And I invite us all to a faith that actually matters today. I invite us to a faith in Jesus, the crucified and risen Lord, reigning over heaven and earth. A faith worth dedicating your life to. I invite you to a faith that makes a difference in your life and in the world around you. The three things we've talked about today. Being a joyful Christian. Being a growing Christian. Being a shining Christian. Christian are ways we find the faith that we've always wanted to have and the faith that the world so badly wants to see in us. So right now, I'm, I want to invite all of us to a decision to accept that salvation and that righteousness of God. I want to invite everyone who feels that tug on their heart to accept that you are accepted in Christ. I want you to accept that, that, that grace and mercy, that faith in the crucified and risen Jesus, that new life, that salvation, that righteousness. I invite us all to that faith right now. Call out to God. Right? We may not know how to find God, but God knows how to find us. Maybe our faith has grown a little cold. Let's call out to God today. Accept the love that God has for you. The generosity, the salvation, the hope that God has for you. That's all it takes. 
I invite all of us to that faith right now. Secondly, I want to challenge this church. I want to challenge us in the year to come to grow like never before in the, in the coming year. I want to challenge us to grow like never before. I want to challenge you to step forward in your faith and in depth. If you pray, pray for one minute more every day. If you pray zero minutes a day, pray for one minute every day. If you pray for three minutes a day, pray for four. Pray one more minute every day. If you don't study your Bible, I would encourage you to add one more time per week to study and to read. One more time. If you do zero, start with one. Put it beside your bed. Put it beside your, your, your chair when you're drinking coffee or, or Mountain Dew in the morning, whatever your thing is. One more time to grow in that. I would like us to grow in, in our witness to this community. 202 people came here because they wanted to know that Jesus is king. I would like you to think of three people that you might tell this year about Jesus. Three. Pray that you will know them. Pray for them. Pray for an opportunity to say, hey, come to church with me. Or three people that you might say when you're having coffee with them, you know, over at Cabin Coffee one day, you might say, hey, let me tell you what Jesus has done for me in my life. Let me tell you how I shine or how I've been forgiven or the joy of the Lord in me. Let me tell you about that because they want to hear. Three people. Three. That we might grow in faith this year and our church might grow as well. I would invite you to be here every time the doors are open to be with God's people. I would challenge us to be that kind of people. And finally, I challenge us to be a church of a shining, glorious, reflecting light. I would challenge you to be an individual of light, and may we be a church of shining light into the world around us, into this town and into this region. May we be that precious thing in the hand of God, and may we shine out like the sun at dawn on a cold winter's day, bringing the light of Christ. May we step out from a place of love, out into the wider world in love in God, and may we make a difference in Christ's name. Amen. Let's pray together really quick, shall we? God, we want to, he we want to hear your challenge and we want to respond to it in faith today. May look May the people of La Crescent United Methodist Church be an on-fire people, a growing people, a shining people this coming 2018. I pray we would accept your challenge. And I pray, God, that somebody here heard your invitation to faith and, and, and mercy and salvation this day. I pray that somebody here heard that. And if you heard that, don't you raise your hand right now? Don't you show me? Why don't you come and talk to me after church today? Thank you. I see you. You come and talk to me. And God, help us to be your people, your light. Give us joy today, we pray. In Christ's holy name. Amen.